Yes. This meeting is being recorded. Welcome, oh. Anya. Please begin your presentation. Introduce well, yourself. Thanks to Anantha from Audiantum. Um, I am able to record the feast talk that I would normally be giving during the afternoon of the feast. Um, I am Anya Yavornitsa, uh, sometimes called Snehova. And I am the Greco Doctrina Service, which means the Greek teaching slave. In other words, I'm the scribe for House Capuchin. Um, I'm also known as the crazy cook <laughs> because I like to cook. I like to feed people. And so I've been involved with the uh, our winter feast and the way it's been put together since our first potluck, which was back in 2013. Um, every winter, usually in February, and it's usually around my birthday, um, we have a winter feast. Of course, the virus has eaten the possibility the last two years. We thought we were going to be able to go ahead and go with a an actual real feast this time and then around New Year's the hall got that we rent got antsy on us and they decided they really didn't want to try, have the liability for people getting sick especially since the last time we had our winter feast there in 29 or 2020 um, <clears throat> two of us did <laughs> both of us uh, two people I was one of them came down with the virus so after consulting with the House members, uh, we decided that this year was going to be a Viking era Norse feast. Um, this was sort of inspired by Rafne, who a number of years ago for the Alpine Scholar Competition for the Principality of the Summits, uh, did a meal that was from this book, an early meal. Uh, a Viking Age Cookbook and Culinary Odyssey by Daniel Sarah and Hannah Tunberg. And this past year, I got a copy of it and started looking through it and went, oh, <laughs> there's plenty of recipes in here. Um, so we started in. Um, we actually have a complete menu as though we were doing this feast, I'm trying to share it at the moment. There it is. Um, if we had been able to do it for real, this is what we would have been up to. Uh, what we do is during the afternoon, there's classes, there's talks, there's bards, there's stories, there's projects. Um, because we've got a big hall available, we might as well do that. But we also set up a side table with spiced cider, hot water for tea and coffee. And then every hour we add something to the table. Um, people a lot of time don't eat breakfast or lunch before they come. So what we had intended was to start with the burka flat, uh, flatbreads, which are from an early meal, plus rye rolls and seed rolls on the table. Uh, excuse me, uh, butters. Uh, assorted pickles and cheeses, and just to have that out on the table. Um, then at 1 p.m. we were going to have a totally not Norse dish, but one that they would have loved. Uh, it was called hot crab when I first saw it in a 15th century Italian cookbook that I can no longer find. I have no idea where that was. But the thing that stuck with me was it's my mother's crab imperial recipe. I grew up in Maryland, and the only difference between that 15th century recipe and my mother's crab imperial was the use of Old Bay seasoning. So we've used that a couple of times for a hot appetizer during an afternoon, and it's a really nice, you know, dip up a spoonful, spread it on a piece of bread kind of a thing. And to offset the heat, we also were going to serve kasik, which is cucumbers and dill with sour cream. Um, it's a Slavic recipe, it's a Turkish recipe, 
Uh, apparently it showed up in Italy as well in late period, but I don't have as much info on that. Then at two o'clock, we were gonna add some more pickles, herring and wine. Oh, our local grocery does a wonderful pickled herring and wine, but also cucumber, asparagus, beet and egg pickles and some cheeses, including skeer. Now skeer is a Norse cheese. Um, it's effectively their version of Greek yogurt. It's a thick yogurt-ish kind of a cheese. It's spreadable. It's spoonable. Um, we've been, we've actually bought some. Uh, there is a brand that you can get at Fred Meyer's actually, uh, which was really tasty. And we've had it with fruit. We've had it with just spices. We've had it as a side dish with meats. We've spooned it in on top of meat and on, of vegetables as a sauce. And yeah, any place you can use a sort of a soft cheese. Uh, also just spread on bread. It's awfully good on dry bread. <clears throat> we were also planning on having girdle cakes with that. Those are a mid period uh, English one in the incarnation that we know them but we tend to vary the flowers, everything from pea flower, which turns them green, which is kind of fun, to um, bean, bean flowers, to wheat, of course, rye. Um, I think we've done chickpea flower too, and, and other things. Uh, and then a little spicing, uh, varying through from garlic through caraway. Um, at 3 p.m. we were intending to do a traveler's porridge. That's the point at which most of the latecomers show up. Uh, traveler's porridge is just a oh, porridge, nothing fancy. Then at 4 p.m. we were going to have frumenti, which is a wheat berry porridge uh, with greens and cheese. Um, and this apparently is a Norse thing. Um, and it was it was very tasty. The the strangest part of it was it was flavored with coriander, which I don't use very much. And that turned out to be really interesting. Well, at that point, we usually reset the hall for the actual feast. And what we were aiming for for the first course was peas in a bag. Yep, take regular field peas, and that was what we had. And I'll show you a picture in a bit. Uh, and you sew them into a bag and boil them in broth. Uh, maybe with onion, we decided that we liked them with a lot of onion, uh, maybe with greens, um, but still they're just boiled peas. Pickle, and then the pickled kale lamb. Now this was a fun one. Uh, we used a ground lamb rather than pounding out as early meal says they used to take, to take a lamb cutlet and beat the snot out of it with a, a regular uh, meat hammer. And we decided to go ahead and go with ground lamb instead. Uh, we had made pickled kale um, with the, uh, and there is on the uh, website with address, which I will give you, there is a recipe for making pickled kale. Um, it's rather than a fermented one, it's one that's actually put into a pickling broth of uh, vinegar and salt and spices. Um, and it turned out to be really tasty with the lamb. We used a curly pickled kale and then um, formed the meat into a long strip with the kale laid across it and a bunch of raw garlics. And then we rolled the thing up and baked it. Now they said to sew it up in a bag and boil it in broth. We just didn't have enough broth to play with. So we went ahead and baked it. Uh, that was served at our potluck yeah, our house has a monthly potluck. That was served at our potluck back in October. Um, again, I have pictures, I will show you. Um, the two other things that were intended to be with this was a poached halibut, um, just, a, yeah, just halibut dropped in a pan with plenty of water um, and a little vinegar um, instead of lemon, the way we usually do it, uh, and poached. And then we were going to have an Angelica flavored porridge for those who don't eat meat. Um, <clears throat> after the main course had been served, uh, the intent was to 
create a Viking longship out of pie dough. Uh, the filling was supposed to be a meat filling, uh, which we did test. We actually didn't end up making the longship, the subtlety, um, because we didn't have a feast. Um, but the sale was laid out at one point and we used, I hope you guys will forgive me. We used a pretzel rod as the mast and um, uh, fruit roll-ups in white and red to make a striped sail. Um, and then sat down and ate it because we didn't have the rest of the long ship. Uh, but it had been intended to be a dragon ship. So if we actually go ahead and do this next year, we will have that one all set up. The second course was supposed to be a filled spit roasted chicken. And we didn't do it as a spit roasted one because nobody had one to use, we baked it. Um, but it was filled with a green filling. Now that's not usual for fowl in American cookery. Um, it was mostly onions and a lot of greens. And again, I have a photo that I'll try to show you. We were going to serve that with bread in a bag, the same as the peas, except this is a bread recipe. Comes out like a dumpling, a rather soggy dumpling. Um, although that may be because I didn't quite know what I was doing. But then with a wild leaf herb and cheese pottage, which we, all, we also had at that uh, October potluck, um, it was rather liquid. Um, I think the, let's see, uh, I'm trying to remember which greens we put in it, but the usual suspects um, and then some cottage cheese and some uh, acid set cheese uh, it was used in that particular dish. And then a salmon on turnip stew, um, which again is a Norse dish, uh, cooked turnips with a chunk of salmon that had been poached laid on top. Not a very difficult dish. The third course, uh, and yeah, there's a lot of meat in this stuff in there, roast pork, and we made a berry sauce. Now this one was really interesting. It was made out of raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, and leeks, go figure. But it tasted wonderful. And uh, it was a little salty, but that worked very well with the roast pork. Um, we had pickled kale and turnips. This was some of the same pickled kale that we had done with the lamb, but it was another bottle and uh, turnips cut into fingers were put in with it, um, just as a side dish. And then we were going to serve cod with glazed roots, which is not an early meal recipe. It's one that I found online and I'm not good at frying fish. And this particular piece of cod was rolled over itself and it was full of bones and it was awful. Um, part of it was cooked and part of it was raw and some of it even burned while I was trying to make sure that it all cooked. So we weren't going to serve the cod unless somebody else was going to cook it. That's the way it went. Um, but the glazed roots turned out to be really delicious. They were root vegetables. Uh, and we used three color carrots, turnips, and parsnips um, with a honey and vinegar mix glaze, and they were roasted. And those turned out just flat delicious. Um, and they were really good with roast pork, which was the December potluck. <clears throat> the last course, um, we were going to have another subtlety, pretzel swords. <laughs> just for being silly. Pretzel rods, gummy lifesavers, dipped in colored um, chocolate, the white chocolate, you know, that you make candies out of, um, just for silly uh, and for something for people to gnaw. We also had an apple fermenti, which was uh, like the uh, veg uh, cheese and greens fermenti that we had early in the feast. Um, it was made with apples and a little bit of honey. It turned out very sweet, very tasty, and it made a fantastic breakfast cereal of all things. 
uh, there were a couple of things that people were going to try to make that didn't happen. Uh, one was the hazelnut treats, which were pretty much just crushed hazelnuts and mixed with honey. Uh, again, the recipe is from an early meal. Um, they didn't have a whole lot of sugar. They had honey and they had sweet fruits and things, but they weren't extracting sugar from them to use in dishes during the Norse Viking era. Um, another one that we had thought to try was malt patties, uh, which again are a, a sweet uh, flour and malt mix with a little honey that are dried, they're not baked. They were dried on stones around the fire. Um, another unusual thing. We were also going to have some traditional cheese and uh, nuts, uh, some of which could have been candied. Um, so, some pictures. Um, what I have opened our nibbles uh, file, and I'm just going to scroll through once I can get the thing to open. Uh, different kinds of things that we've made and for various feasts. This one we probably would have used more beans, mushrooms, and uh, kale and turnips for pickles. Um, but here's a mushroom pickle with uh, pickled red onions in it. Um, a bean pickle, again with red onions. That this right here is roasted garlic, which is really good on bread. Um, it's a little fiddly uh, and it's hard to get out of the thing, but for a feast, who cares? You know, it, it's fun. It's something different because we people rarely do that. Roasted garlic is not as harsh as raw garlic. And uh, I think it's really delicious. Uh, I use it to also to make roasted garlic butter. Um, and you can kind of see in this picture, there's a, there are a couple of different butters. There are garlic butter and a blue cheese butter next to it. And of course, olives. Olives are all over the place. Hazelnuts. And the Norse would have had hazelnuts. They probably had walnuts. Anything other than that um, is going to be really hard to prove. They, there are some charts in the back of an early meal. I should open them up so you kind of see where they have, um, okay, what did they have in the way of foods? Uh, that's, that's a whole listing that they can prove, uh, which is really the cool thing about this book. If they found it anywhere, um, they've got the English word, the Latin word, Danish, German, Icelandic, Norwegian, and Swedish. And then those are the different language names. And then they have where it was found. Uh, let's see. Um, Fig-leaved goosefoot, uh, which is a fairly common herb. It's a chenopod. Um, we, we have goosefoot that grows out here. Uh, and that particular one was found in York. Um, you know, you, and you can go on. You've got leeks. Let's see. Allium portrum. They were also found in York. Millet was found in Hedeby and in some of the other places. Um, but nuts were harder to come by. Why, I'm not certain, but it probably has to do with the rough nature of the, the land in Nor what's now Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. Um, these are dates. They did have some available once in a while, but they would have been a real luxury. And here's a series of butters that we had at one, one feast. Uh, an urban onion butter, a garlic butter, and an Italian butter. It was Italian seasoning and salt. This is a, a jar of pickles. And there's turnip, there's carrot, there's parsnip, all in a pickling broth with a lot of mustard seed and caraway seed. Uh, very tasty. This is bacon and blue butter on a roll that Lauren made, um, plain white flour roll. But bacon and blue cheese butter, no, they didn't make that. 
but everybody loves it, so we end up serving it. Um, the sources on the flavored butters are late period, but chances are at some point somebody stirred honey into butter and somebody stirred something else tasty into butter at some point. Um, we just don't know when. <clears throat> Here's another pickle. This one has garlics in it and because it has coriander in it, some of the garlics turned green. <coughs> Pardon me. I believe this is a bean pickle. That's a salal berry jam. We grow salal out here um, on the Oregon coast. Um, again, this is a pickle. This is a mushroom pickle, but that's all the onions on the top of it. Oh, there's the salal berry jam uh, finished in a little jar or in a little bowl. Uh, pickled walnuts, which we think they may have had, but it's not listed in an early meal. Um, and then because this particular picture is from a Slavic feast, we also had uh, uh, Kminovi Tvaro, which is a caraway cheese, uh, another acid set, uh, which they did have uh, in in uh, the Norse Viking era, and a wine mustard in the other jar. Here's some more pickles, um, again from the Slavic feast. So we had um, pickled sausage, pickled onions, pickled beets. Uh, there's some garlic cheese and also pickled eggs. And then this herring pickled in wine. Um, they did a lot uh, the Norse in the Norse era with herring. Herring is a nice fatty fish. Uh, it's very tasty. You have to get the bones out of it. But once you've got the bones out of it, it's a great fish for cooking. And our local grocery does a wonderful herring pickled in wine, uh, which is a recipe that is found in, uh, in um, mid-period, uh, basically the Middle Ages um, in uh, in various recipes. And then pickled asparagus. And the dish behind with the red spoon in it is hot crab that I talked about earlier. I think I have another picture of this. There it is, hot crab. Um, it's just baked um, and it's very tasty. There's, oh, there's the Kaminovi Tvarag again. And a whole thing of cheeses from, this is from the Slavic feast again. Um, excuse me, there's a whole two cheeses, bread, there's some more cheese back there, jams, and all the things that go along with cheese for the side table. Pickled onions. Um, onions and pickled onions were a vegetable in, in period for everybody, not just the Norse. These are dilly beans. Essentially, it's the same kind of a pickle but it's green beans, which no, they didn't have in period until very late, um, but they're really tasty. Um, this is from another potluck. I believe it's the October potluck. And there's some sliced salmon. There's some cheese. I think uh, there's the skier, but I, I'm, this is another cheese that was brought a walnut salad, pickled beans, pickled Brussels sprouts, pickled cucumbers, bread. Oh, and even a roll of embroidery because that's what people were playing with. Um, another cheese, another cheese. I'm sorry, the pictures are so small. Uh, there's the salmon, the walnut. Oh, pickled mushrooms. Now, there's not a lot of direct evidence for pickled mushrooms. There is literary evidence, um, and I'm talking about in the Norse culture. Uh, because pickled mushrooms happened all over Europe, particularly Central Europe. Uh, these mushrooms in particular were pickled with mustard and onion and a little wine, uh, which is a later period English recipe. Pickled Brussels sprouts. Um, I really don't know how far back Brussels sprouts go, and I should have, before I put the picture in here, I should have looked it up. But those were purchased, because, and they're really good. These were a farmer's market pickle made with, uh, I'm calling it that, um, I'm, it's my pickling broth, but with far, the irregular farmer's market pickles. Um, and so that you know, it's now February. 
I made them in August and they're still crisp and tasty. Pickled beans with onions, typical. Um, that's a soft cheese, but I'm not sure which one. It may be skier. This is a roasted garlic butter. And another picture of all the nibbles. And that this little stack over here is uh, marzipan. Uh, onions in process of being pickled. These were end of the season irregular um, onions and they would have been served probably with the pork um, to uh, pickles taking the sort of greasy taste out of the pork can get. Again, the bacon and blue cheese butter. This is cacique. It's cucumbers. Um, you soak the cucumbers or you salt the cucumbers overnight after they're sliced. And if you look at them, they're peeled, uh, half the peel has been taken off. Um, then you pour the water off, you add dill, um, at least for this recipe, uh, and sour cream. And this is a very common Central European dish, at least from the Middle Ages on. Uh, it probably came from Turkey or by way of Turkey or the Middle East um, because it's, it's very common there in their cookbooks. And again, another nibble tray, black olives and a roasted garlic butter with bread. And I believe that's the end of that file. So let me show you a few of, oh, no, the soups. Now, we had gone back and forth about what to do about soups um, because they're, they make a really good first course for most feast meals. Uh, they're also relatively inexpensive and they just sit in a pot and cook. So it, they're not difficult. Um, these are soups from other feasts, a lentil pottage, uh, a bread and cheese soup, um, which we've got proof of in Scandinavia in the 1500s, but not proof earlier, although some of the pots could easily have been used for that. This is, again, the bread cheese soup. Oh, and uh, borscht, obviously Slavic, but it's a beet or a root vegetable soup. And root vegetable soups are listed quite often. There's another, oops, there's another picture of borscht. It's a uh, hard borscht, not soft. In other words, it's got all this, the chicken and the beets and, and the barley and everything else in it. This is a harvest soup uh, in process. And I kept the picture because I wanted to show you. It's got little bitty carrots. It's got radishes that were getting too old. That's an onion right there. These are carrot tops. Uh, there are some bits of leek back here. You can see that one. Um, and there are the bottom layer down there where you can see the liquid uh, is some meat that was left over from something. Um, and uh, harvested greens, wild greens like plantain, dandelion, um, there were also some beet tops in this one. It eventually turned kind of reddish uh, and some wild mushrooms that had been harvested and dried to be saved for this soup. Um, this is another one, a similar one. Obviously it's got more modern ingredients because it's got celery and potato in it, but it's sort of a clean out the ice box kind of a soup. Uh, clean out the ice box, make sure you've got plenty of vegetable, make sure you have at least a sniff of some kind of meat, um, a, assuming you're not feeding a vegetarian. If you're feeding a vegetarian, you just add lentils or beans instead of the, instead of the meat. Um, okay, so let's see, then the main dishes. I was talking about that lamb roll. Um, that's what it looks like when it's done. You can see the garlic in the center and the pickled kale wrapped up in the meat. And there was very little spicing in it. There was salt. Um, there was some ground caraway and that's it. Uh, and it was good. Um, Ilantha could tell you. <laughs> she had some of it. Uh, I was talking about It was pork. great. 
And I don't like lamb. Oh, well, you know, I don't either, but the particularly, um, I always slather it with mint sauce or something like that. But in this particular case with the pickled kale, it ameliorated the odd flavor that lamb seems to have. And especially because when we say lamb, this was a late season lamb, it already weighed 80 pounds. Um, it, it, for, in other words, it was a, almost a yearling, but not quite. <laughs> That's a pretty big, tough lamb, but it still worked just fine. But here's one of the pork roasts. Uh, this was done with apples and dates uh, in the roasting juice. Um, this is uh, basically bacons or salt pork and greens. Um, there are a couple of dishes that, <clears throat> excuse me, that were that would have been made this way. Um, but this is entirely speculative. I think the greens in there are spinach, plantain, and leek. Yeah, spinach, plantain, and leek. There may be some onions in there too. Um, here's somebody's plate full of supper. A roll, some of the lentils, a uh, cabbage and other vegetable pottage, for lack of a better term, uh, and a chunk of pork meat simple meal. This is a fermenti. This is that cheese one that I was talking about, and it's partially finished. You see how it has the wheat berries, which are this orange stuff here, and then the greens aren't all the way cooked through, and then there are these chunks, large chunks of cheese. Um, as it heats, it melts, and it becomes really tasty. There's another version of it, and this one had uh, carrot tops, leeks, beet tops, um, that looks like a turnip leaf, uh, plus probably some other wild greens. Oh, that, this may be a dandelion leaf. Can you tell I use strange things out of my yard? And this is a dish that was part of a subtlety, but, uh, and I'll explain that in a minute. And it's actually French late medieval, <laughs> but the idea of chopped meat rolled up with breadcrumbs or some other kind of grain that's been mushed. Um, there's a, a Norse one that is lamb and oatmeal. Um, but these were made as dragon eggs for a French feast, and that's why they have the gilding all over them, because <laughs> obviously dragon eggs have gilding. Another pork roast uh, that's sitting in its grease. Um, the This a lot of the time I cook things ahead of time and uh, then slice because pork doesn't want to slice. You saw that with the other plateful. Um, pork doesn't want to slice unless it's cold. But if you then take all the little extra bits of meat and grease and add a little flour or a little barley, a little crushed wheat, uh, you have a nice gravy um, or the base for a soup. This oh, yeah. is, is a to go vegetable with that? pottage with that was made from that the 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 grease and the broth and the bits of the previous uh, soup. Anya, These is there an image chickens. here? Uh, there was that. I'm seeing the list of flatbreads and bread and subtlety and oh how odd because I'm cheese. I'm clicking through I'm clicking through pictures. You're reviewing on your screen, but I don't see anything except the word program with the, oh. the list of the oh. menu. You know what? Let me stop sharing for a moment and, and go back and reshare it. Can you see the uh, menu? I see you. Okay. Uh, because you stopped sharing, so. Oh, and it, yeah, it, it isn't showing the window at all. Nope, just showing you. Yeah, I don't, in the choose what to share, it's yeah. not showing anything but, well, it says Chrome tab, but when the window, it's not showing it, entire screen. Hmm. 
let's see, let me click back. Okay, are you still seeing me? I am still seeing you. I have no way to share it because it says choose what to share and all it has is the entire screen bit. Okay, let's see if we can fix that. I can click on select a window or application you want to share just like you can. It's got a whiteboard, okay. iPhone pad, your screen, and Facebook. <laughs> so we're going to go for you. Oh, did I lose you? I'm, I'm here. You're there. Okay. I'm, I was looking up something so that I can click over to a, uh, a different screen if I have to. Oh, what a very strange system we have. Technology sometimes gets the better of us. Do you want to stop recording for a minute? Uh, you're muted. Okay, I see a picture now of part of a piece of metalwork, but you are still muted. It okay, I hear said you. Said I was muted because I was sharing audio. There's no audio on that website. How oh, very strange. Um, let me try it again. Okay. Uh, it's actually not metalwork. Oh show you here we go um try this again chrome tab early meal Hmm. Okay, there's a picture of you making the stuffed roll. Can't hear you, but I can see your mouth whipping. And that's a very good picture of the lamb roast, lamb roll. Okay. <laughs> Since it's going to mute me apparently when I go to the go to the website. Um, yeah. That was the, the pickled kale and the lamb roll in process in the picture. And I'm going to click back over to that and see if I can scroll it down a little bit so you can see more. Okay. Okay, there are the steps for putting it together. Ingredients and all of that good stuff. And this is in the pot with hand pies on the side. With, I remember yes, that. With the pair of hand pies. That was the finished roll. Um, obviously, sharing stuff on Chrome isn't going to work if, um, if I mute it all the time. I wonder if we can go to, not in the Zoom, but go to Chrome and make copies of those and put them in your computer. Um, well, I have them. That's what oh. I was sharing before. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I, I thought maybe it was like a document in your, an image from your um, photo. It, it is from the website, but the, the, a lot of this stuff is uh, there. Um, okay, wait a minute. Let's try this. There we go. Now I've got my window back. Can you see that? It's coming up. My computer's a little slow. Okay. Says, okay. These, now that is, tell me what that is. These are mortar chickens. Um, it's a late period German recipe. Um, basically, it's chicken cooked, mushed, egg added, and then turned into little pancakes. And this sort is of one of the dishes that we were thinking about using for the afternoon. 
like we make crab cakes, it's chicken another, cake. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, here's another set of pottages, etc. cetera. Um, one that happens to be more beets. Two that uh, this one is oatmeal and this one is barley and pork. Um, uh, can you see this picture now? Yes, that's lovely. Uh, this is a Czech dish that's out of period, probably, because it has potatoes in it. But uh, it's kohlrabi, which is an unusual, they often call it a root vegetable, but the bulb grows above ground. <coughs> has lovely leaves that are very tasty and have a lot of, have the same kind of texture as spinach. Um, but and our modern it, culture doesn't use the leaves as much as it uses the, the bulb. Right. And I grew up in a family where you used everything. Um, that's how I ended up using, you know, the tops off of uh, carrots and yep. the leaves off yep. of beets and everything else. This right here is a piece of kohlrabi. And so is this one. The, other, the others that show are mostly potato and leaf. Okay. Um, beets in a couple of different colors. Uh, period beets, actually they're red, sort of orangey red and yellow. Uh, period, excuse me, um, period beets were not the kind of red that we're used to. Uh, matter of fact, there's a, you see the picture fairly often on Facebook if you are a, a plant type person of what looks like a candy cane striped beet. That's actually a much older beet than these bright red ones we have that are so sweet. This is uh, the lamb roll, um, cut in half and about to be cut into chunks and served. You can kind of see how it's wound up here with the garlic and the, the kale. Uh, just some more beets. Uh, this was an egg porridge. This is the uh, greens and cheese. Sorry for the size. Oh, here's the egg porridge. Um, this may have been made uh, in Scandinavia um, in the early Renaissance. It's definitely post-Norse, but effectively what it is, is eggs and a grain and nuts and dried fruit that are then cooked in a pan until it gets solid, then dumped out on a plate and sliced. I say it looks a lot Did like fruitcake. It does. It really does. It doesn't taste a bit like it either. Um, it's an unusual flavor. Did you get any of this at the October potluck? I don't think so. so. I think that's when I did that. There's that the lamb roll again. Some bread. There's the the egg pottage cooking the beets and the cheese stuff. Yeah, that was that. Okay. Now this is the green filling for the chicken. There's a couple of hard boiled eggs in there. There's some leeks in there. There's spring onion, um, quite a bit of spring onion. And it looks like that's about all that shows on top. But there you can see a little piece of uh, carrot greens. And there are more, the usual suspects, plantain, dandelion, et cetera, et cetera, down below there. This is the chicken they were stuffed into. Oh, and bread, and, and there's, okay, there's the chicken taken apart. That's why I skipped through. This uh, you can actually you see some of the, yes, this is the chicken that had been stuffed. After I took it apart, put the dark meat to the right, the white meat to the left, you can still, the reason I saved the picture was you can still see some of the spices that were mixed in with the stuffing. Okay, let me back up a couple pictures here. That's bread that we had for the one feast. Um, this is a red cabbage and uh, rice dish that we had at one point. And those are carrots, believe it or not. They were cooked in honey and they just, they just turned into these little wizened lumps that were absolutely delicious. Um, okay, here, it, this is called Lachschmutz. This is another one of those German recipes. It's um, pork and leeks and onion. Basically, you, this is one of, was going to be one of the hot dishes. Uh, there, uh, 
I picked this one because there is some evidence that they did something like this in the Norse stuff as well. One of the big things with the Norse cooking is that there are no cookbooks until you get well out of the Viking era Norse uh, time frame. Um, there are descriptions in uh, various literary sources, um, the sagas. You know, they yeah. they sat down and they had pork, roast pork and mutton and beer and mead until they all fell over drunk. Um, you know, typical, that kind of a description. Um, but so it's a recreated cuisine. That's one of the thing. One of the things that they really talk about in this book is what they were basing it on. Even the frumenties, we know that the Norse cooked wheat, boiled. We know that they cooked it with cheese. We know that they cooked it with what looked like greens because they're taking what's left in the pots and examining it so that they can figure out what the stuff was. But do we really know? No. So we're making guesses. And this was a guess of mine that this Lakshman's recipe, uh, which is late period German Renaissance, would have also been uh, something similar, at least in Denmark, if not across uh, the sea. Um, it is uh, leeks and onion cooked in butter until they are transparent. And then you hack up a pork chop, <laughs> in this case, and throw it in. Um, until, until it's all cooked through and you top it with bacon um, or smoked pork chipped. Um, and that would have been very tasty, uh, the, the fat and so on. Aha, this one, these are the peas. They don't look much like the green peas that you see on your plate, do you? Do they? Um, these are yellow field peas uh, and this, this stuff is leeks that's with it. Um, again, there's like dandelion leaf. Oh, there's some thyme in there, things like that. But you can see the bag. And that's, I cut the stitching on the bag and plopped it down on the table. And this is what you see. Um, the peas are soft enough to eat, um, but they keep their structural integrity, unlike, you know, the usual dried peas um, in this kind of a treatment. Uh, mostly because they're not getting bashed around in a pot. They're in the bag and they're just simply boiled. Um, <clears throat> I enjoyed them. I really did. Uh, and I, we've made them since um, a couple of times just because I thought they were really tasty. And here they are set out for serving. Tricolor carrots um, with also some little tiny ones from the garden. Uh, the tail end of the season, you have to dig everything up and you're going to use it up or you're going to lose it. So we might as well eat it. So we did. Um, they're dry. I don't have any sauce on these or any butter or anything else. They were simply boiled and tossed in a bowl. And when I did that, they do dry, the surface does dry out. Um, another dish, uh, some more of those little itty bitty carrots. That's why I saved them. And you can see the salt that I've got on it. And yeah, obviously that's totally not period corn. This is the berry sauce, uh, what it looks like as it's finished. Uh, you can see the different colors of berries in there and you can see the bits of leek. And these are the roasted root vegetables. Um, what kind of parsnip. berries, if I can back up just a little. Oh, sure. Um, I used raspberries, blackberries, and blueberries. It was a mixed frozen vegetable, or excuse me, frozen berry mix from the grocery store, uh, which is typical for that time frame of cooking because they didn't separate stuff out the way we do. They didn't really have the luxury. They used what they had. And raspberries, blackberries, and blueberries, quite often as the raspberry season ends, blueberry season's in full roar, the blackberries are just starting. So I figured that putting these in with leeks would make sense. Um, this was a fantastic sauce on the pork. Ah. Okay, so back to the root vegetables, carrots, uh, parsnips, and turnips. And 
you can see how some of the pieces are shorter and they've kind of gone down to the bottom. <coughs> but this was with a honey and vinegar glaze. Ooh. Very, very tasty. Okay, now this is somebody's feast plate. Um, and this part here was the filling for the long ship. This has the berry sauce on it and it's just uh, ground meat um, on that side. And then there were some carrots on the plate. Um, the filling for the long ship was ground meat, mushrooms, um, wild blueberries. They weren't yes. wild, they were frozen from the grocery. Um, and then I threw in onion and uh, carrot, sort of as an experiment. It tasted really good together. So it's, I think filling a long ship, that would work. It's beautiful to look at. I think so too, yeah. Oh, and another version, these are black eyed peas, uh, another version of the peas in a bag. And those, that batch had a lot more onion in it and everybody found it tastier. Um, these are some pies. Um, these were not supposed to be in with the main dishes, although this is a greens and cheese pie. I can't remember what it's called. Oh. Anyway, it has a very specific name for it. it oh, Ember Day Tart. Uh, this is an Ember Day tart. This is a cheese tart, and this is a cheese and ground meat tart. Uh, and this was made with ground uh, ground pork and um, a soft cheese, like a cream cheese. Except I think this was this this it was an acid set cheese, but I'm not sure exactly what it what it to, what to call it. This is another dish that they could very easily have done, but we don't know for sure that they did. Um, this is carrots, onions, cabbage. Um, looks like turnip, uh, maybe parsnip, and probably some mushrooms. I would bet that's a mushroom right there and right here. Uh, and then slathered with cheese and thrown in the oven. They didn't, the, the Norse didn't do as much on oven cooking as we did. They didn't really have that many onions. That's why you find the bread boiled in a bag, more like a dumpling. Um, but they did have ways of cooking things as though they were in an oven, uh, very much the way journey cake was cooked in a couple centuries ago, where you have a Dutch oven. Um, in the Norse case, it would have been a probably a soapstone crock uh, that had a tight fitting lid uh, that would have then had a clay or something fitted into the edge so it's not what's in it's not going to escape. Basically you pile this stuff in, put the lid on, cover it with clay, then you stick it in the fire and pile coals on it. It's a small serving uh, oven and it's not something that we would have any way of doing these days. So usually stuff like that gets cooked in a, like a foil pan in the oven. It sounds like a bean pot though. Yeah, it's the same idea as a bean pot. And I should have said that instead because um, bean pots are often sealed that way too. So that might be a similar, uh, something we could do to try to imitate their system. Yes, yes. And that's the last of the main dishes. Uh, show you a few plates here. Okay, are you seeing a plate? Not yet. Or you, okay, then I probably need to unshare and then reshare and there we go. Now? It says it's coming up. Okay. Started sharing. Come, this come. plate is Carrots baked with honey. There it is. Uh, frumenti with greens and cheese and bacon. Essentially salt pork fried, but it's bacon. Um, here's another one. That's a piece of very fatty pork uh, with some wild rice that was cooked in broth uh, and an assortment of greens. Um, these are red lettuce, green lettuce, uh, beet top, excuse me, beet tops and 
that's another variety of lettuce right there, but I'm not sure what type. I think that's a bit of turnip green. And in the rice, I also cooked some pine nuts because we had them. And that's what this is right here, which would not be Norse, but yeah. Um, well, they had pine this trees. Was a, yeah, but they didn't, we, well. We don't know. Yeah, I don't think the pine nut trees grow that far north. Uh, I'm used to seeing quantities of pine nuts from the area around the Mediterranean and the mountains ah. surrounding that. Um, this was a late harvest dish. I think this is the potluck in October. We did a pork roast that had a gravy that was pretty much just a reduced juice. And then these squashes and peas and mushrooms and onion. Um, they did not have squashes in the Viking era. Those don't show up until after Europeans were in the Americas. Um, but they did have gourds from pretty much France south. Um, and they had marrows, which are a similar dish and they would have been used, or a similar plant, and they would have been used in a similar dish. Um, again, non-Norse. Uh, this is a, it looks like just a root vegetable mash and some kind of meat and then mortar chickens. This is a baked chicken, um, a barley fermenti, not a wheat fermenti, and carrots. Um, there's your peas in a bag. There's the, oh, this was a sweet and sour cabbage. That's right. And then those glazed carrots that we saw earlier. Uh, and then uh, the lakshmuts on a trencher and a little bit of chicken on a trencher. Um, this was the cod. And if you know anything about fish, you can see it's raw and it's scorched. <sighs> fish is one thing I don't know how to, how to fry. These are the glazed root vegetables and these are the black eyed peas. And that's all that's in that album. So let me switch out to the last one, um, which is the afters. Um, we're used to having sweet stuff at the end of a meal. So if you're doing a feast, you have to kind of, oh heavens, now it doesn't want to show, share the, the window again. You. Um, if you're doing a feast, you kind of have to pander a little bit to modern taste. Aha, that's why. It didn't open all the way. Now let's see if we can share it. There we go. And have sweet stuff. Um, they would have had stuff that was more like filling up the corners. Nuts, cheese, a lot of booze, <laughs> lightweight booze, uh, mead, short meads, um, ale, beer. Um, but we like something more solid and something sweet. So this is a frumenti with apples and honey, and you can see the little wheat berries in it. Um, these are spiced sugared nuts. Uh, the recipe for these is Le Viandier de Talibet, uh, the way I interpreted it, <laughs> which I have been told by a number of people that it's absolute anathema to do them this way, but <clears throat> um, I thought that's what it said. Anyway, they're sugared, uh, spiced, and the sugar was cooked to a fairly high temperature in a crock pot with the nuts stirred into it, and then it was poured out on, on a plate. Um, oh, sweet stuff. <laughs> this is from the Slavic feast again. It's babovka and kolacha. Uh, grapes. Any place they had grapes, they'd make a, they make a great dessert. Um, strawberries and raspberries, those are from the garden. Um, and these are some pan pies and bread. Ilantha, aren't those yours pies? I believe they are. 
I'm not sure what was in them at this point. Let's see. We had some peach and we had apple, I believe. Okay. They look might have, might really have been good. fig. There may have been some fig. Oh, I think you remember you saying figs. Here's the, the pear hand pies. Yes, they are um, definitely fig. The uh, This kind of tart, this kind of red-ish tart thing, and these kind of hand pies make a great thing to send home from a feast with people, especially if they're hot and it's a winter feast. And this is a halva, believe it or not. Uh, it's a halva from an, a ninth century recipe that one of the house members found and she's, she loves it. Um, and I think that's all what, of- Do you know what's in that? I think I see a cashew. It's, Raisin figs, uh, figs and um, figs, cashews and something. Figs, cashews and dates. Mm. Uh, and it's very sweet, but it was also very tasty. Um, one of the things that we discovered in the course of all the various uh, research that we've been doing is um, that halva is a name for something squishy and sweet <laughs> excuse me up until about the 12th century and now it's sesame seeds ground uh, with sugar and some other flavorings rose water orange blossom water that kind of thing similar to marzipan uh, but from the middle east and and there was one set of photos that we didn't hit. Um, just a couple of, this was, and it, uh, oh, I need to go back and share it, don't I? Because you're not seeing it. Whoa, wrong uh, yeah. window open. You're cute though, we yeah. see you. <laughs> Let's see here, there we go, there we go. Okay, this, this was an attendee at one of the feasts who was contemplating his apple fermenti uh, <laughs> and uh, it made me laugh it was like you know he, Ed, he had his hat on because he was cold okay i love it um this is another one of our house members this is james um who absolutely loves having anything to do with feasts and food um but at that he doesn't cook much he's a he, uh he's the one that did the girdle cakes a couple mm. years ago and that's me, <laughs> and that's Gudrun, um, and her then buddy behind her, whose name I don't remember. Um, but I think I was telling a story, and somebody caught her attention um, while I was telling it. And that's me telling my stories. Um, so, okay, that's enough. I have <laughs> a pictures. question. Give me sure. a, a sort of a definition of fermente. Fermenti is a, uh, a grain boiled in something flavorful generally um, with whatever additives you choose to put in it. Um, so it could be it sweet be or savory. It, it, yes, both. Uh, and we had, and I, I showed both here because we had the apple, which was sweet because it was apple, a little bit of honey in the wheat berries. And we had the savory ones, which had the greens uh, and onion um, and usually they were cooked in broth. Okay. Um, quite often, uh, fermenti, particularly as you get later period English, uh, they're cooking it in almond milk. Um, because almond milk doesn't curdle the same way that cheese does when you boil it. So you get a smoother dish. And it's rice pudding, which you can have both sweet and savory. But it's rice pudding is a type of fermenti. Most people, when they say fermenti, they assume wheat, wheat berries, uh, wheat, basically seed wheat, um, most people. Uh, but it can be made with wheat, with oats, with rye, uh, rye berries. Um, I tried that and they come out very hard. Mm. Uh, not good for old teeth. 
might take a lot longer to cook the rye berries. Yeah, and I think that's what I'm going to do the next time. And I didn't cook a whole lot of them, and there wasn't a whole lot of liquid. It was an experiment. Didn't work real well. So what um, would be your distinction between frumente and pottage? <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. What's the difference between pottage and forage? Um, the words are interchangeable depending on who's speaking and when and where. Um, the closer you get to the end of the Renaissance, the more fermenty seems to be just wheat. And pottages uh, may or may not have meat in them. Pottages, pottage, porridge, porridge ends up now being assumed to be something like oatmeal and usually done sweet. More grain. Um, but porridge, the farther back you go, the, the, the wider, the, it's, it's like the halva, um, where before 1200, it was, yeah, it was squishy and sweet. Um, and then after that, it's more and more, it gets to be the sesame seeds. Um, so it, Oh, <laughs> um, they're a very flexible. I, there, name, I am I sure that there are food historians out there who will give you solid answers. My answer is it depends on who you're talking to, okay, and what you call it, and what the recipe was called when you picked it up, or how somebody told you to make it. Um, I kind of like my grandmother would always call it cream, uh, call it uh, farina. What, what she made for us for breakfast. Uh, everybody else calls it cream of wheat. <laughs> yep. And it took me until I was in my 50s before I figured that out. Because she was going with a, a brand name that she knew and associated with it. Well, farina is a name for a particular preparation of wheat grains. Which, and that which is I, now remember, called, I remember I remember as a now, child it was sold under that name. As sold as Farina? Yeah. Yeah. Babichka, I don't think Babichka picked it up that way because she was, a lot of times she was grinding her own stuff. Ah, probably not. Um, she also didn't speak English all that marvelously well. Hmm. If you've ever heard me imitating my grandmother um, or, or putting on my Czech accent and imitating the way she spoke. Um, <clears throat> yeah. She was an awesome cook. And, and sounds like anybody a wonderful who, person. Uh, anybody who was an awesome cook, you put the two of them together, it didn't matter if they both spoke English or Spanish or whatever. The one I remember is her taking off from the table and invading the kitchen of a Chinese restaurant and telling them how wonderful the food was and asking how things were prepared. And they told her and she went home and she knew how to make egg foo young. Which and they couldn't speak made. each other's languages. Not a word. That's beautiful. <laughs> That's beautiful. It's, uh, it, you know, and she's the person that got me started cooking at the age of three. And she got me started embroidering as well. But she's my hero. Um, one of these days, I keep saying I might get to be as, in her league, maybe, <laughs> as far as cooking goes. That's like but in any case, inspiring person. The, that's the story of the feast of what we were intending to have. Um, I don't know what the house is going to choose for this coming year. Hopefully we'll be actually able to have a real feast again um, and have some potlucks like the one in October with, with you and Helen Louise and, um, and with when James was up here in, in November. Um, I hope. I hope, I hope. We're going to think powerfully that way. Yeah. So are you finished recording? Shall we save I this for indeed. posterity? Thank you. Let me find the right spot. Thank you all. <laughs>